Welcome to The Revivalist, a broadcast originating from River of Life Church in Pekin, Illinois of the United States of America. I'm Pastor Mike Forbes, and I come to you with a burning vision to proclaim the whole counsel of God and the full power of the Holy Spirit. Let us begin to worship. Revival Church. I believe with all of my heart that, that God is moving to lift up revival churches and God is moving to, to lift up just revival centers across this planet in these last days to bring in a glorious harvest. And, and a while back I began to just really begin to seek God and to call out to the Lord and, and ask Him to show me in my spirit, to show me a revival church, to show me what a revival church would look like. 
and began to really pursue the Lord on that and talk to the Lord about it. And then a while back, I was at a conference in Lexington, Kentucky, and, and one evening I went to sleep, and, and just immediately after I fell asleep, I began to dream. And in that dream, the Lord showed me coming back to River of Life Church where I pastor and teaching and preaching through John chapter 15. And I, and I couldn't explain it, but I just had a sense in my spirit, I had an understanding in my spirit that this was in the context of revival. This was going to share something with me about revival. As I began to, to preach through John chapter 15, it was, it was kind of an amazing thing because many times when I would be up preaching, I'd be up teaching, as I was doing that, the Lord would be speaking to me about a revival church and showing me that outline, that blueprint for a revival church right there in John chapter 15. As a matter of fact, there was times at the services when we would have altar calls and be praying for people. I'd be praying for people and God would begin to speak to me again about a blueprint for a revival church. So the Lord has shared that with me kind of almost in an outline form out of John chapter 15. And I just kind of, to help you understand what I'm talking about, just kind of imagine this. Imagine you were to walk into a church meeting. Whether it be in a building, whether it be in a tent, whether it be out in the wide open, no matter where it might be, that you were to walk into a church meeting. And you just, you know, you encountered some people, I mean, they were plugged into the Lord. You could just tell they were trusting God with all of their hearts and all their minds and all of their strength. And, and you just, uh, you know, you looked at these people and you realized their life had been cleaned up by the Word of God. They had been purged by the Word of God. And, and they had a just a dynamic relationship with God. They were abiding in Him and their Word was abiding in, and His Word was abiding in them and their, their prayer life was, was powerful. I mean, they could shake a nation just by praying. And these people were amazing too because no matter what came their way, no matter whatever came against them, I mean, they just were full of joy no matter what circumstances, no matter what consequences might have been in their life, no matter what was attacking them, they were always full of joy. And for the first time in your life, you, you had come in contact with some people who truly loved one another the same way that Jesus loved them. And I would say at that point in time, you'd say, wow, I just walked into a revival meeting. I just walked into the midst of some revival people, a revival church. And you would be impacted greatly by that. And what I just shared with you, beloved, is just, just an outline, verse by verse by verse, from John chapter 15, that is verses 1 through 12. That is exactly what Jesus is talking about, exactly what Jesus is teaching about at that point, verse after verse after verse. That is the type of church we would see birth out of John chapter 15. And so it's easy to see how that's an outline of a revival church. That's an outline of a revival people. So I just want to talk to you a little bit about that this morning. And I want to talk to you out of John chapter 15, verse number 1. It says, I am the true vine, and my father is the husbandman. Now the first few words there, I don't really grab our attention. Jesus says, I am the true vine. For many years I would hear people talk about that verse, and you'd hear them say that Jesus said he was the vine, but there's more to it than that. Jesus said he is the true vine. He is the true vine. Here in America, we're in a time and it just, I guess you would call it moral relativism. Everybody thinks they can have their own truth. Everybody thinks they can choose what's true. And I always go back, I remember myself years ago before I came to Christ, there was a time that I was actually hitchhiking in Southern California and some people picked me up and there were some others in the back of a big old truck. And they said, do you want to you go have some free food and free meal? And they took me back in the hills there and there was a cabin there. And we went into that cabin, there's these big long tables and they were just full of food. I mean, this great big glorious feast. And they began to feed us and we're rejoicing in that. And then after we're done with that, they began to share Jesus with us. And I remember I walked outside and I was standing on the, the porch of that cabin and one of those gentlemen came to me and, and began to talk to me about the Lord and talk about Jesus. And, and for some reason, it's just always stuck with me. I, I just stopped him. I said, you know, sir, I said, all due respect, but I worship God in my own way. And I don't know why, but the Lord has just used that and printed that upon my heart. Because you know what? The Lord wasn't a bit impressed with me worshiping God in my own way. We don't get to choose how we worship God. He's God, we're not. He chooses how we worship Him. He chooses how we relate to Him. He chooses how we praise Him. He chooses how we pray. He chooses. He is truth. And Jesus is saying here that He is the true vine. We don't get to choose the vine. We don't get to choose what kind of vine we want in our life. Jesus said he is a true vine. 
As I said, here in America, we're in a time of just tremendous upheaval. We got the Democratic Party, they've got their own truth, and Republican Party's got their truth, and socialists have their truth, and anarchists have their truth. I mean, we've got people all over the country right now trying to lay claim to their own truth, as if they can just pick anything they want to be true. Across the planet, we see people doing that with religion. We have people who are Hindus who say they get to choose their truth, or Buddhists get to choose their truth, or Muslims get to choose their truth, or atheists get to choose their truth, as if we can all have our own little valid truths. But Jesus kind of shoots that in the foot right here when he says, I am the true vine. I am the true vine. I am the true vine. The only true source for man to turn to is Jesus Christ. The only true source for man to turn to is Jesus Christ. I uh, Many people would say at that point in time, boy, pastor, isn't that, that awful exclusive? I mean, Jesus is awful narrow about that, isn't he? And again, I would respond and say, no, Jesus is not exclusive at all. Jesus is not narrow at all. He's stating that he is the true vine, but everybody is invited to come partake of that true vine. Jesus tells us in John 12, 32, and if I be lifted up from the earth, I will draw all men unto me. Uh, notice there, all men unto me. All men unto me. He's not excluding anybody. He's not leaving anybody out. He was lifted up from the earth when he was placed upon the cross. And he, all the sins of mankind were placed upon him at that time. The Bible tells us there was a time that when Jesus was upon the cross, he cried out, my God, my God, why hast thou forsaken me? And I always share with people that, that, that verse really disturbs me because I understand why that he was forsaken because our sins were placed upon him. And for that period of time, there was separation between him and the Father because he was paying the price for all of mankind's sins. He was the paying the price for my sin, your sin, everybody out there on this planet, Jesus Christ was lifted up and paying the price for their sins. I am, and now he sent the church out, we're proclaiming the good news of Jesus Christ, we're proclaiming the gospel that Jesus Christ died for all men, the Holy Spirit is working and moving in the hearts of men, and drawing people to them, and beloved, that's exactly what God is doing in the day and hour we live. God is an inclusive God, not an exclusive God. He never meant to rule anybody out in any way, shape, or form. When Christ went upon the cross, he went there for all men. He went there for every individual. The book of Hebrews says, He by the grace of God should taste death for every man. That's Hebrews chapter 2, verse 9. 1 Timothy chapter 2, verse 6 says, He gave himself a ransom for all. For all. Revelation chapter 2, verse 22, verse 7, or chapter 22, verse 17 says that the spirit and the bride say come and let him that heareth say come and let him that is a thirst come and whosoever will let him take of the water of life freely it is an open invitation to come to jesus christ it is an open invitation for anybody to come to that true vine and so he, he's no way shape or form exclusive but he includes every single person on this planet now the question you say you were talking about when you uh opened up and began about revival churches now, to explain to me, preacher, how that has anything to do with a revival church. Because it tells us what the heart of a revival church should be. You see, beloved, if, if God the Father loved this pe people in this planet so much that he sent his only son to die and pay the price for the sins of every man, shouldn't we as a revival people, shouldn't we as a revival church likewise have the same type of heart? I've always went back to the parable that Jesus taught of the, the Great Supper. And in the Great Supper, it's, it's a time when uh, uh, this, this gentleman in the parable had prepared this great big feast. He refers to it as a Great Supper. And after he prepared that great big feast, I mean, he, he then sends them out and says, okay, go out and tell those who were initially invited, tell them that everything is ready and to come unto my Great Supper, to come unto my Great Feast. Well, as they went out and they invited them, they found out that, that they had excuses. I mean, one of them says, you know what? I just bought all this land. I, I, I'm busy with that. I can't possibly stop this and come to that great supper. There's another one that says, well, you know, I just bought all these oxen. I can't possibly uh, leave all these oxen that I've just got and come to any great supper. So please, might I be excused? Another one says, well, I just got married. I can't leave my, my new wife and come to some great supper. I always found that humorous. I thought maybe he could have took his wife with him, but he saw that as an excuse that he was married. 
And so they, when they went back and the servants told the, the master and says, they, they've all made excuses that none of them want to come. The master then says, no, go, 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 go. And he told them to go into the highways and the hedges and the, the streets and the lanes and, and, and compel people to come in. He said, go to the, the halt and the poor and the maimed and, and the lame and compel them to come in my house. Why? Because that's the same heart that we see in the Father when he sent his son Jesus Christ to pay the price for mankind's sin. That's the heart of the Father for lost people. And that should be the heart that you and I have in us. As a revival people, we need to have that same same heart. We need to have that same love. We need to have that same motivation. A revival church would be a church that had that same love, that same heart, and that same motivation to reach out to all people who are lost, and not to be exclusive in any way, shape, or form. You know, it's interesting that over the years that I have, uh, at different times and different places and in different capacities, um, taught evangelism classes and done a lot of evangelism as far as going out into, into the streets or whatever and did that capacity, witnessing the people. And, and one of the things I found when I taught classes that it didn't really bear a lot of fruit. I mean, you could go into a church and maybe that church is just kind of stagnant about reaching out to people. You could go into a church and maybe the people are just, you know, not motivated in any capacity to do any outreach into the lost world. And you can teach them and teach them and teach them and teach them all kinds of techniques. You can teach them all kinds of presentations. You can teach them all kinds of different means and ways of reaching out to people. But if they're stagnant in their heart, then they're still going to be stagnant no matter how much you teach them. You see, evangelism is a matter of the heart. When we see that God the Father, it says, He so loved the world that He sent His only begotten Son. It was the love in the Father's heart that caused him to reach out to, to lost mankind. It was the love in the Father's heart who, who, who motivated him to send his son. It was a love for lost mankind that, that Jesus went upon the cross and paid that price for them. So you see, true evangelism begins, beloved, when Romans chapter 5, verse 5 kicks in. Romans chapter 5, verse 5 says, The love of God is shed abroad in our hearts by the Holy Ghost, which is given to us. So if the love of God, that same love that God had in his heart when he sent his only begotten son to pay the price for our sins, if the love of God, that same love that was in Jesus' heart when he went upon the cross to pay the price is in our hearts, then obviously we're not going to hesitate to reach out to a lost and dying world. But beloved, truly a revival, a revival church, truly a person of revival has to be somebody who is motivated, motivated by love. And, and you might say, you know what, preacher, I, I guess that's good, but I can't possibly imagine what an impact I could have. I can't possibly imagine what effect I could have. Well, let me talk for just a moment about your prayer life a little bit. That love of God in our heart is going to motivate us to pray for the lost. You don't have to encourage your mother to pray for her lost children. Why? Because that love is inside of her. So if we truly have the love of God on the inside of us, then we're going to be people of prayer who are going to be praying for the lost. And, and a while back here, just a, just a week or so ago, I was in my office at the church, and I, and I began to talk to the Lord about some things. And one of the things, he really just kind of showed me a vision. He showed me a picture in my spirit. And the picture of me in my spirit was, he showed me me in prayer. And he began to speak to me that, that when I come to that place where with all of my heart, all of my mind, all of my strength, I'm truly putting my faith and my trust in the works of Jesus Christ, in the death and the burial and the resurrection of Jesus Christ, and the ascension to the right hand of the Father. When I come to that place of complete and total trust, I'm praying in the name of Jesus, and from that place, I can shake the world. From that place, you can touch the world. Beloved, you can come to that place in prayer where you're putting your faith and your trust wholeheartedly in the works of Jesus Christ, and that prayer can be so powerful, you can shake this planet. That prayer can be so powerful you can shake your city or your nation or wherever you might be. You see, a beloved, a revival person, a revival church is a place and a people who can shake a world with their prayer life. And the way we do that is not by my works, not by my deeds, not by my efforts, but by my faith and my trust in the works of Jesus Christ. That's what he's talking about when he says that we go to the Father and we ask in the name of Jesus. I ask in the name of Jesus. 
I'm asking that this prayer be answered on the basis of what Jesus Christ has done. I'm asking this prayer be answered because of the Jesus Christ going upon the cross. I'm asking this prayer be answered because of Jesus Christ being buried and resurrected and ascended to the right hand of the Father. And, and beloved, our prayer life can shake nations because we're plugged into the true vine. Because we're abiding in Christ. I am... Uh, there's a passage of scriptures in 1 Corinthians chapter 2, verses 1 through 5, and quite often I, I share with that, and, and, I, and I read that backwards. And, and key here is verse 5, let me read that to you quickly. That your faith should not stand in the wisdom of men, but in the power of God. So you see, beloved, what we need to come to the place is that our faith is not in the wisdom of men but in the power of God. The Apostle Paul said in verse 4, And my speech and my preaching was not with enticing words of men's wisdom, but in demonstration of the Spirit and of power. A revival church is a church that has demonstration of the power of God and demonstration of the Spirit. And you notice verse 3, Paul said, And I was with you in weakness and in fear and in much trembling. Why? Because he understood it had nothing to do with his ability. The key was verse 2, For I determined not to know anything among you, save Jesus Christ and him crucified. In other words, he said he had determined to teach them to plug in to the true vine. He had determined to teach them to entirely and completely trust them and the true vine and absolutely nothing else. And as a result of bringing that church to that place where they wholly and completely trusted in Jesus Christ, they would see the demonstration and the power of Almighty God. Beloved, that's the key. That is the absolute key, and that's why it's so important. We look at John chapter 15. We might just skip over some of those words. We might just pass by and say, I am the true vine. In our lives, we need to plug into the true vine and absolutely nothing else. In our churches, we need to plug into the true vine and absolutely nothing else. Jesus Christ said we can do all things through him that strengthen us. Because we're plugged into that vine. Jesus Christ said that he would supply all of our needs according to his riches and glory in Christ Jesus. Because we're plugged into that vine. No matter where you're at right now. No matter what situation you're facing. I can assure you. I can assure you. I can assure you that the answer is in that true vine. I can assure you that if you need. If you have never been born again. And, and you've never come to Jesus Christ. That you can plug into that true vine. You can place your faith in the death of Bury on the resurrection of Jesus Christ and plug into that true vine and become a new creation and have the Holy Spirit come and live and indwell on the inside of you. I can assure you maybe you're sick in body and you're afflicted and you need a miracle right now that you can plug into that true vine because that vine has healing juices, a healing anointing to flow from that vine into your life. Just like in the Bible, the lady with the issue of blood touched the hem of Jesus' garment and then when, he did, when she did that, the anointing flowed out of Jesus, flowed out of the true vine into her body and made her whole. Right now you can with your faith reach out and touch the hem of Jesus' garment and plug into the true vine and that anointing will flow and make you whole. You might be facing a situation of a physical need in the sense of finances. I'm guaranteeing you can plug into true vine because he's there to give you provision. You may be in a position where you're in some kind of bondage to some kind of demon from hell. You can plug into that true vine and he is the one who will set you free in the in the name of Jesus, you, that, that bondage can be broken, you can be liberated, and you can be set free in the name of Jesus. That true vine is the answer for every situation you face. It may be prayers for your family, it may be prayers for your children, it may be prayers for your church, prayers for your community, but I'm telling you, plug in to that true vine. The true vine is Jesus Christ. The true vine is Jesus Christ. And I encourage you right now, lift up your eyes of faith and put them on the true vine of Jesus Christ. He is your answer. He is your healer. He is your deliverer. He is your solution. No matter what you face, I'm telling you, in the name of Jesus, you can be set free. Glory to God. Hallelujah. The true vine. Hallelujah. Praise God. Just want to share with you a word from uh, 2 Corinthians chapter 9, verse 6. It says, but this I say, he which soweth sparingly shall reap also sparingly. He which soweth bountifully shall reap also bountifully. We're broadcasting this today from River of Life Church in Pekin, Illinois, in the United States of America. 
And this church is a tremendous testimony of that simple principle. We learned a long time ago that we could sow seeds into other ministries and, and begin to see a harvest come in from that. And this broadcast today is a result of that harvest coming in. And we just want to encourage you that you can send a seed into this ministry, the seeds that come into this ministry, but we use for this purpose, and that is to expand what we're doing, to reach out to the world with the Word of God through media. And you can send any seeds you'd like to send in to River of Life Church, Pekin, Illinois. That's P-E-K-I-N, Illinois, 61554. That's in the United States of America. God bless you, and believe God's going to bring in a bountiful harvest in Jesus' name. Praise the Lord. We're going to conclude today's broadcast with some worship. And I just prayed just a second ago, and I could just see it in my spirit that all across the planet, people were calling on upon the name of the Lord, and God was pouring out His Spirit and performing miracles. People coming to Christ, being baptized in the Holy Ghost, bondages broken, people just being healed in the name of Jesus. And I encourage you right now to just call upon the name of the Lord. Lift up your heart as we begin to worship, and focus your faith on Christ, and believe God for a miraculous outpouring of the Holy Spirit right now in the name of Jesus. Hallelujah. Mm -hmm. 